Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Textile Talks. I'm Jamie Swartz at the International Quilt Museum, located at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. The International Quilt Museum proudly stewards and exhibits the world's largest collection of quilts and related textiles that span five centuries and over 65 countries. In fact, that is our mission and our passion to build a global collection and audience that celebrates the cultural and artistic significance of quilts. Uh, before we begin, we got to recognize and thank the organizations that partner with the International Quilt Museum to bring you textile talks each week. The Quilt Alliance, SACWA, and Surface Design Association. We're honored to bring you free and inspiring program with, your, with the help of our sponsors. We couldn't do it without their generosity and the generosity of viewers like you. Uh, just a few things before I introduce our program, please use the Q&A for questions, chat box for greeting others, survey for comments and ways in which we could improve. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button to toggle them on or off. The live captions makes Textile Talks accessible to a wider, wider audience. If you prefer not to view captions, you should be able to turn them off. Next week's talk is gonna be great. Join the Quilt Alliance for the third interview in their year-long Quilters Save Our Stories impact series on the February 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, episode three features an interview with Annie Ruth Ware Brown, conducted by uh, historian Adana Richardson for Quilters Save Our Story. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you again to our sponsors and thank you all for supporting this program. I'd love to introduce our guest of honor today, uh, Ben Venom. Thank, Thank you, Ben, you. for uh, agreeing to join us for a textile talk today. Huge fan of, of your work. <laughs> yeah. Thank uh, you for having me. Great pleasure. Yeah, uh, would love to, you know, start with a great question for those who might not be familiar with your work. What would you like them to know? So I describe, <laughs> I describe my art as a collision. It's a collision between fine art craft and what I would refer to as the fringes of society. And that's things like skateboarding, punk rock, heavy metal music, uh, et cetera. And I take all these somewhat disparate elements and I combine them or collide them into the form of a functional piece of artwork. Typically a quilt, a tote bag, a curtain, or a custom made jacket. So again, this one, this idea of functionality is of great importance to me. I love that. Um, you often use recycled fabric and textiles in your work, right? Correct. No. You want to talk about that? Where do you source it? Why do you choose these materials? What, what importance does recycling have? So recycling is another concept behind my work that is that is on the forefront of what I'm trying to do 
in so much as used fabrics that are that are reused, upcycled, and this idea of taking fabric that belonged to somebody else and then reusing it in, in another piece of functional uh, form, typically like a quilt. So this way, if someone were to donate fabric to me, a piece of themselves is now part of the quilt. So it's not just mine, it's ours. So everyone's unexplained stain, tear or rip is sewn into this fabric of the quilt. It's uh, all their personal memories, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, objects have lives, clothing has a history. So maybe you had the pair of pants that a uh, pivotal moment of your life happened when you're wearing those, but you can't, you don't wanna just throw them away, but maybe they're too threadbare. You send them to me and I can cut them up and now they can live on in a second, a second life as a form of a piece of artwork or a functional piece of artwork. So I really like that kind of connection. Uh, furthermore, I live in San Francisco, California, and we are one of the first cities in the United States to ban the use of plastic bags. So this idea of, you know, environmentalism, recycling is very important here in the city. And I took that mentality and applied it to my art making practice. So not all the fabrics I use are recycled, but I would say the vast majority are. So in my studio, there are various bins of like used denim, used t-shirts, used bandanas, used leather jackets, et cetera, that I kind of pull from when I'm building my, my artwork. Cool. So are they, do these uh, items have like any personal connection to you or your friends or family? Yeah, absolutely. So the, this quilt here has a bunch of jeans that belong to my wife, my brother-in-law, a good friend of mine. Um, I've made in the past like year or two, I made a tote bag that was entirely from recycled denim from a really good friend of mine's father who passed away. He was in the Air Force and he was also a big fan of the Rolling Stones. So I made this kind of Rolling Stones slash United States Air Force logo tote bag made entirely from his jeans. And I, then I gave it to her. So then she, it was something that was of great importance to her and her mother. I also made another bag for them too as well. So that kind of like direct connection between the fabric and the history that that fabric had is one distinct example. But this piece here, Flexor Head, is definitely something that has a lot of different material in it. Um, like I said, from my wife, case in point, there's bandanas in there, there's used, used leather jackets and um, obviously a bunch of denim and some waterproof camouflage. Oh. So I like that kind of different mix of fabrics. I'm not using just one type of thing there. But again, like this idea of like using stuff that's given or donated. Um, whereas like a lot of quilters would, case in point, like the, the quilt, quilters of G's Ben, they would make their quilts they would come together towards the end and the community would help them kind of do like the final stitch per se. For me, like my community comes from the people that donate the fabric mm -hmm. that becomes the foundation of my, of my work. And so like I do all the sewing for the most part entirely myself. Cool. Thanks for the insight of your work. How, do you wanna talk about maybe the next one? Next quilt? Then we can go to the next slide here. Um, and you can tell me, uh, I'd love to ask you another question. Oh, how long have you been quilting or sewing? What was like, what, what inspired you to start quilting and sewing? Because many people often are curious how guys take up sewing. Yeah, I made my first quilt in 2008. Yeah. And Back in 2006, I saw the Quilts of G's Ben exhibition at the De Young Museum here in San Francisco. And I was really blown away by the work from uh, those women in that community. Being from the deep South myself, I, I had a connection to that region. And it was interesting to see work from the deep South where I was now, where I'm now living here in San Francisco. But the fact that they had used a lot of uh, hand-me-down fabric, et cetera, was really interesting to me. And so I had that in the back of my head 
And then fast forward two years to 2008, I was asked to be in an exhibition in Berlin, Germany. And this was gonna be a pretty big exhibition for me at the time. And I'd already been doing a little bit of sewing while I was in graduate school at the San Francisco Art Institute. But for the show in Berlin, I wanted to kind of do something a lot different and kind of break out of my current method of working. And so I bought a book called Quilting Basics 101 and taught myself how to make a quilt. And so I made that first quilt in 2008 and it was made primarily from my old uh, band t-shirts that I had lying around from when I was a teenager. So a lot of them are kind of torn or ripped or threadbare. I cut them up and then turn them into this kind of uh, larger quilt. I think the quilt was maybe about like five feet by seven feet, folded it up, put it in a, in a little cardboard box, got on the plane to Berlin, put it in the overhead compartment, got to the airport in Berlin, walked it through customs. They're like, do you have anything to, de to declare? I was like, no. Walked it right through, took it to the gallery, and it was one of the larger pieces in the exhibition because I was able just to kind of fold it up and walk with it onto the plane. And from then on, I was really interested in this idea of working with textiles, mainly because this idea, again, of art and functionality. Around that time, around the 2008 time frame, I was, I had kind of hit like a, um, a crisis of conscience within my art making practice where I wanted to do something that was, that could go beyond just a pretty picture that was hung on the wall at a gallery or a museum. I wanted the art to, to have more dimension to it. And that's what ultimately led to textiles is something that I can uh, do a variety of kind of imagery, use different materials, even if you don't like any of that, if you don't like the concept, if you don't like the materials I'm using, at the end of the day, it's still a functional piece. And that was of great importance to me is that it can still be used in a variety of ways, keep you warm, wear it as a jacket, uh, as a tote bag, it can carry things, a pillow, a curtain, et cetera. So I've got a question about the functional aspects of your work. Do you sleep under your own work? I don't, I have not. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. No one's ever asked me that question. Um, that's a great question. However, some of the some of the collectors, I know one or two have used it, uh, some of the quilts that, have, that they have purchased, um, one, one collector in particular, but that person doesn't like, it's not like on a nightly basis, I think. It's like if they have like a dinner party or something like that, they'll put that on their bed, you know, kind of more of a, as a display aspect for like home decor, I suppose. Yeah. But uh, they do, have, it is functionally a quilt. It has the, it has the batting in it. And I typically use like a mid loft uh, polyester batting. Mm. I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so you draw a lot on heavy metal and biker culture, and then you have a quilt that says kill them with kindness and floral print fabric, which seems to kind of um, upend your expe the expectations that people may be familiar with your work. Um, do you want to care to explain like the genesis or the story behind this quilt? Yeah, of course. So the Kill Them With Kindness is a reference to this band called Idols. They're out of England. They're relatively new. They've been around for a little while. And they have a song, Kill Them With Kindness. And I, I just thought that was a really interesting song. It's, it's a phrase that obviously has been around for a while. But yeah. I like this kind of opposites attracting, uh, again, this collision of opposing forces. So it's this somewhat very strong saying, but then it's it's comprised of very colorful floral fabric and then I overlaid across uh, used and recycled denim jeans uh, mixed in with uh, the tan as Carhartt fabric and then the red and black as bandana fabric. Oh. So I like that kind of like two things kind of being collided together. Uh, and when you kind of like shoot opposing articles at each other like the large hydron collider, collider it's like, something new is, is, is made, new energy is released. And I always have that in the back of my mind is kind of taking opposing forces and then colliding them. And this is a, a very good example of that uh, within my artwork, the Kill Them With Kindness quilt, which was done uh, pretty recently within the last like year and a half or so, 2022. Uh -huh. 
we're just into 2024 now, but, and it's pretty large, you know, like 80 mm -hmm. by 83 inches. Um, and it's pretty detailed. It's all applique uh, yeah, stitched and, on there. And it is machine applique, right? Right, I'm running it through my own machine. It's a, I have a Juki F600 Quilt Pro Special. Mm -hmm. It has like a nine inch throat. So it's not like a tiny little machine, but it's not a fully industrial machine with like a belt motor or anything. But uh, it works well for me. And I, I'm able to do a, like a lot of kind of slower detailed stuff like with the applique and the satin stitch, uh, which is why I, I tend to go to that machine in particular. Uh -huh. But Again, this this particular quote is a good example for a lot of the work that I do is kind of, you know, taking disparate elements and then combining them together in the form in the form of a piece of art. The, yeah, it's great. I love it. Do you um, have anything else to add about this piece, or you want to talk about? You've got a, we've got a number of pieces to lined up to discuss today. Do you want to move to uh, the? I'll just say real quickly, like the, the pattern around the border is like to mimic barbed wire. So again, that kind of aggressiveness, yeah. but, and then combined with the kill them, but it's with kindness. So it's meant, for, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, meant, it's meant to be peaceful. It's, it's, it's meant to project a message of peace and, and love. Yeah, it's kind of, I love the contrast, especially with like the really kind of masculine fabrics, the car heart, the bandana, even jeans and combined with the floral fabric is really, um, it's really delightful. But and then, <laughs> at, but then it's a quilt, it's fabric, yeah. it's soft fabric, right? Yeah. It's not <laughs> harsh. It's, it's a, not like a strong object or anything. No, it's a, a paradox in a way. Exactly. Um, Oh, this is totally different, I think, and then <laughs> standing here in front of your work. Yeah, tell us uh, about this. this. isn't necessarily a quilt, is it? No, this is a, a curtain that was commissioned by the interior designer, Ken Folk. He is based out of uh, San Francisco, but he's internationally known. He was doing uh, a restaurant up in Sonoma, which is wine country. It's about an hour, hour and a half north of San Francisco. It's at a place called Little Saint. The restaurant is a vegan restaurant, but then upstairs they have this event space and they asked me to do a curtain to basically cover. There's like a big movie screen behind the curtain. And then what they do is they put a small stage in front, kind of where I'm standing there. And they have uh, bands play. And they have some pretty big acts, like the space is quite large. So they've had some pretty big musical acts over the last two years. The restaurant's only been open for about two years. And the curtain had a lot of different, working with Ken Folk and his designers was a very like laborious process because the curtain had to kind of match the interior design and decor of the rest of the restaurant. So colors and the design and et cetera. So they had a, some pretty firm kind of requirements for it. I had to make a sample of it, like a small sample about this big that I had to give to them physically so they could look at what I was gonna do. I sent them a bunch of mock-ups, like digital mock-ups of it for the design. And then all the, the fabric is a bunch of used band t-shirts, denim, bandanas, and Carhartt fabric. And it's about like 30 feet wide and 15 feet tall and it opens in the middle. So it's like two parts. And I worked with, I was consult, consulting with a drapery specialist that's based here in San Francisco about how to like make the curtain because it had to be made so that it could be installed on the existing hardware. So there's a ripple, ripple, fold, ripple fold track at the top, which is why it's like this. And so I had to figure out a way to make it go onto that existing hardware. And the drapery specialist, Surma, uh, we met a couple of times and she was like, oh, you got to do this by this much fabric. It needs to have like a 60% fullness, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and one thing I would say, like whenever I speak to students, I always say like, never let your lack of knowledge prevent you from carrying your idea all the way through. And this is a very good example of that. I've never made a curtain in my life. This is my first curtain I've ever made. And it just so happened to be a giant curtain. 
But I figured out a way to make it by consult reaching out to a drapery specialist, meeting with her multiple times, and then kind of going back and forth with the designers at Ken Folk. Because when they first asked me, they're like, oh, could you do a curtain? I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. Knowing full well, I had no idea how to do it. But I just like, I'll figure it out on the way. But then, like, if you notice at the very bottom, that bottom border is a little bit wider than the rest. They had me come back up there after the curtain was already installed and, like, unfold that bottom half to make it longer because it was a triple triple fold so it was already installed so i was literally like up under that curtain like with the seam ripper trying to like let one fold go down and then had to like have my sewing machine there and like like basically hem it while it was hung uh giant pain in the butt but um it worked out (laughs) yeah it looks great and and the design is to mimic kind of like stained glass mosaic yeah, I can see that. It's really cool. Recognize some of the band T-shirts in there, and some of the fabrics. It looks like the same um, um, same floral print is in the yeah color. yeah <laughs> this, right leftover oh. stuff. Don't nothing is thrown away. Totally love it. Yeah, and that, I'm just there in the photo to give you an idea of like height wise, Damn. you know, because it, yeah. it's kind of hard to gauge. It's pretty big. Yeah, it's massive. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm impressed with your uh, willingness to just take a kind of a Herculean task and uh, complete it. It looks so beautiful and cool. Love and it. one last thing I would say is that I made this like hmm. basically at my apartment, but like we live in a building that's like four units and one of the units was vacant at the time that I was making this. Yeah. And I was able to gain access unbeknownst to our landlord to that unit. And <laughs> I pretty much like laid out the curtain in that uh, empty unit in our building. And then I would walk up the back stairs. sew it in my studio, then walk it back down the back stairs, kind of sneak in to the vacant <laughs> unit to lay it back out to kind of like, you know, based it together and stuff so it kind of worked out well and then uh someone moved into that unit recently and they were familiar with my artwork and i was like oh yeah you know that curtain that i made like as i actually made it in your apartment (laughs) don't tell our (laughs) landlord Wow, I'm a bootleg artist studio. <laughs> yeah, do what you got to do to get it done was kind of yeah. the mentality of it. So, um, sewing something, figured so it out. Yeah, wow. Um, incredible. We've got something completely kind of different here. It might, um, might be a little. Oops. Sorry if you're frightened by this. Anybody at home who's watching you didn't expect to see something <laughs> like a big pentagram made out of. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's it's uh, tongue in cheek. It's really cool. Yeah. So you want to tell us about this? You you told us a little bit about it before. Yeah. So I grew up skateboarding. Uh, Thrasher Skateboard Magazine is based here in San Francisco. And I went down to the magazine uh, a couple of years ago, met with the, the current uh, the, the editor-in-chief uh, of Thrasher, Tony, and was like, hey, I want to make a quilt for you guys. And he's like, yeah, I'm totally down. And so I went next door to the warehouse and he's like, you know, take whatever you want. So I got a bunch of Thrasher t-shirts and then made this quilt. The design is based off of their the Thrasher skate magazine logo which is like a they call it like a scapegoat hmm. so it's like two skateboard wheels on the side and then kind of this like oh you know, kind of scary goat head and and then like you see in the middle part there's like a bridge that's the golden gate bridge and there's all these little references within it uh you know the still watching on one of the horns is a reference to the former editor uh jake phelps who passed away a few years ago and the Thrasher Skate and Destroy. And uh, all again, all the shirts are Thrasher-based t-shirts. The 666 is referenced to the store. Thrasher has a store uh, in downtown San Francisco and the address is 66 6th Street. So it's referenced to the store. And then (laughs) SF California, because it's based in San Francisco, California. And it has, the pattern is kind of these like lightning bolt background pattern. 
and then the the my version of their logo as the forefront. The blue, the bright blue fabric is from Lizzie Aramato's. Uh, it's similar to the uniform that she wore when she competed in the Tokyo Summer Olympics. She's a professional skateboarder. She rode, she represented the country of Finland and she wore this really amazing kind of overall uh, uniform when she com competed in the Olympics for, and that's uh, one of, she sent me uh, one of those uniforms that she had had and I cut it up and then uh, turned and used it for this quilt for the kind of the eyebrows and the mm -hmm. beard. And it was just this really amazing fabric. Again, she's a professional, she's a woman professional skateboarder. That's pretty cool. So just kind of an ode to her, ode to San Francisco. And as far as I know, it should be hanging in the, in the Thrasher office. Um, at least that was the idea. But I, when I went to go drop it off, we were over there chatting and Tony was like, yeah, I want to hang it on this like concrete wall over here. <laughs> and one of the other employees was like, oh man. And he's like, well, now we're going to have to drill into the wall. <laughs> and, I was like, and I was like, oh God, that, that's going to be, I was like, good luck with that. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it should so be hanging come, over there. Oh, did they commission this piece for, from you? Yeah, it was a commission piece, but I, I gifted it to them. Like I said, I grew up skateboarding. It was kind of like a, you know, a thank you to skateboarding awesome. from my standpoint. And we have a uh, the backside of it too as well, right? Yeah, so it's kind of two sided, and that's still watching is referencing the former editor, um, Jake Phelps, who passed away. I think it might be about three years ago, mm -hmm. and he like his like kind of graphic icon was like these eyeglasses because he wore glasses. And he was always known to wear like a Ben Davis or Carhartt black vest. And so the eyeglasses are made out of my old black Carhartt vest. So if you look in the upper right, that's like a Carhartt tag. And then you'll see it again in the W of the still watching. And so that's a direct reference to him. If anyone's grown up skateboarding, you're familiar with this. You're familiar with Thrasher. So this is like all, you know, pulling from that culture. Again, like I grew up skateboarding and that's still a part of my life. My daughter has expre expressed some interest in skating. So we've, I've taken her out on, on, uh, on her skateboard and my skateboard a couple of times. Cool, love it. <laughs> Keeping it, passing it down. Maybe she'll take up quilting too. Oh yeah, she's, we, we've sewn a couple of tote bags together and oh, I've made a couple God. of her Halloween, Halloween costumes and um, oh yeah, it. totally. She's Love in the it. studio all the time. <laughs> Love it. Uh, we have your quilt in the, the pages of Thrasher, too. Is there, um, when was this issue? Maybe this was know. January of, mm -hmm. of this year, so basically like about a month or so ago. Yeah. And it's just oh. like in the back part of the magazine. So this was like, for me, this was kind of like a bucket list thing, you know, growing up reading Thrasher and then I, uh, you know, I'm in the magazine, so that was a big honor for me. Like, I didn't know they were going to do that. That wasn't really my intention. Oh, really? I was hoping they would use the quilt for something like that, you know. <laughs> so I was pretty excited when they were like, oh, yeah, it's going to be in the magazine. So oh my God. It, was a, it was a big honor. And there's like some little blurb. It says like, so gnarly, you know, S-E-W, tongue in cheek. Yeah. You know, let's see your mama <laughs> do that. You know, it's all just kind of playful tongue-in-cheek yeah and it's totally, got a picture so. of you in action there are you... yeah it's me in my studio uh, working <laughs> on it can. exactly exactly <laughs> it looks great oh my gosh yeah you finally got to appear in the pages of thrasher and i know i texted him yeah i texted <laughs> all my buddies i was like check this out and i was like i'm in the magazine i'm not skating but i'm in the magazine it still counts <laughs> It's pretty amazing. I'm sure like you're uh, the teenage version of you is really hyped. Um, my teenage self's head would have exploded. You know? <laughs> now and like the, I'm in my, I'm in my mid 40s now and I'm like, oh yeah, that was cool. But if I was 15, I'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, you, when you started quilting, you probably never imagined that it would take you 
back to skateboards, did you? Or maybe it was a conscious No, decision. not really. No, totally um, not. But I, I like that again. It kind of reflects on this kind of opposites being combined. It, you know, quilting and skateboarding are pretty far apart, but not when not when it comes to me. Yeah, and you even uh, your quilts ended up on skateboards, right? Like mm -hmm. this creature skateboard. How did that yeah, come about? So the Preacher Skateboard Company had reached out. They had, a good friend of mine had designed a couple of skateboard decks and he had passed my name on to them. And they're like, yeah, let's do a couple. We did four designs, so four skateboard decks. This is just one of them. So I ended up, they gave me a bunch of Creature Company t-shirts and I cut those up and then made four quilts that were very like rectangular because you, you know yeah. skateboards are a very a, a rectangle shape yeah we have they're, they're they're yeah they're the quilts I had my photographer photograph them and then sent a very high res uh tiff file of each of the quilts to creature skateboards they took that and then turned it into the skateboard that you saw in the previous uh image so each one of those pieces there became a skateboard and you know i knew the dimensions so i knew to make it like it needed to be like you know this long but only that tall to fit on the skateboard deck because you know they have to round out the edges so that's why there's some negative space around you know the corners because that's going to get rounded out for the for the tail and the nose of the skateboard yeah, but yeah. um yeah it was, it was pretty i think they came out pretty well this is a couple cool. years ago. Yeah, I love the uh, day glow on the camouflage. It's a really fun contrast. <laughs> yeah, it um, really pops in the, the background is like bleached uh, black denim jeans. So kind of this uh, harkening to like the 80s acid wash. Because my we live in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco. So it's, you know, very tie-dye and psychedelic. But uh, for me, it's like my kind of reference is more of like the eighties acid wash that speaks mm. more to me than like the psychedelic tie dye. But I like this idea of like electric acid, like some bright colors are attractive to me. They're pretty cool. And do you do all of your quilting too on your quilts? Yeah. Yeah. I do all the sewing myself on my machine. I, it's, yeah. um, I have yet to use a long arm at some point. I'd, I'd like to be able to long arm them, but they're all done on my Juki. And it's all applique. I typically use a, a dense satin stitch. Mm. And like I had said earlier, I use kind of like a mid to low loft batting. So just because I'm doing a lot of detailed stitches, um, kind of much like embroidered stitch. So I don't want it to be too thick. Yeah. Do you use anything to like stabilize all these different fabrics? Yeah, that's a yeah. great question. I, yeah, I use only in the last like I don't know, maybe like five to seven years, I started using like stabilizer. Mm. Uh, a good friend of mine, she is an amazing artist. She does, makes these really incredible banners. Her husband's a tattoo artist. They're in Ashbury Park, New Jersey. Her name's uh, Megan McClevy. And Megan was like, hey, you should start using stabilizer. I think it'll help you when you're doing these like dense stitches and, and it'll keep like the fabric, you know, from bunching. I was like, okay, great. Yeah. So that was like a really good recommendation. And that kind of brings up another point, a little bit of what I was talking about earlier about not letting your lack of knowledge hinder you from doing what you want to do. And, you know, I came into the textile medium, you know, a very, very basic novice. And I still consider myself like at best, maybe like an amateur, but it's always like trying to learn new ways to make it and shortcuts and a better way to make it more professional so this idea of like always asking questions and always trying to improve on what I'm doing and you know using stabilizer was was one of those things years ago that was recommended to me and and also you know 505 basting spray which I think was sent down from the heavens of the quilt gods that stuff is like amazing so I use a lot of that for basting Oh, I was going to ask you, yeah, what you use to baste your quilts. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so you that, saw the first t-shirt quilt without any stabilizer? Is that right? Yeah, that was a giant effing nightmare, yeah. <laughs> okay, interesting. Yeah, bad idea, I don't do that. Yeah, okay. so, you know, <laughs> live and learn, you know, that was kind yeah. of a, 
a free unofficial plug for 505 basing spray if anyone's listening you know hook it up sponsor you. it's not cheap but um great yeah. great product oh so yeah i came into being familiar with your work through your use of t-shirts because i saw this really great quilt with all these like metal t-shirts including a I remember a Hawkwind t-shirt on it. Or, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget it because I'd never expect to see a Hawkwind shirt uh, at the yeah, totally. Museum. Uh, but yeah, that's a good that's a good one. <laughs> uh, I love they love your reuse of these band t-shirts throughout your career. And this this piece is really pretty cool. So do you want to talk about it a little bit? The yeah, this is a, this is an yeah, totally. So this is another really good example that kind of represent this piece and the Kill Them With Kindness are some pieces that are a good representative of like all the work that I do. And so this one was a commission by the musician Bron Daler. He's the drummer for the band Macedon. And these are a lot of these are his t-shirts he had had you know, saved since he was a young teenager. Uh -huh. He's um, a little bit older than I am. So he's like in his late forties now. And he wanted like a, a custom jacket. So I, I make these fully custom jackets. They're made from a pattern, much like you'd make like a suit or a dress. And uh, they are a collaboration with my good friend Tool, uh, T-U-L. Tool is a chain stitcher based in Los Angeles, California. And so him and I, collaborate on these like fully custom jackets. And this is just one of them that we had made. This is one we made for Braun. So like I said, a lot of these shirts had meant a lot to Braun. Like he had had them for many, many years and he sent me a box of them and I cut them up and made this kind of, you know, very reference like quilt kind of like pattern. And then I sent it, I sent it down the tool, tool. Like I had, I cut the pattern the fabric was cut into the pattern. I sent all the disparate pieces of the jacket down the tool. Tool sewed it all together with the collars, the buttons, and then the inside has like some chain stitch, like Ben Venom tool uh, mm -hmm. collaboration that he chain stitched on the inside, you know, property of Braun Daler, all that. That's like an end part of the lining. And then this piece was exhibited in the, uh, for a show I had at the Birmingham uh, at the Midlands Art Center in Birmingham, England, back in uh, 2019. Hmm. And then it's, so it's traveled a little bit. And recently it was at the um, Hickory Art Museum in Hickory, North Carolina. So Braun was very generous to have loaned it out to two museums in the last couple of years. But um, he wears it, it's meant to be worn. He's worn it around town, uh, et cetera. Love it. Is the the chain link fence in reference to um, what is it in reference to anything in particular? And immediately, I thought of like a parking lot at a, like a venue. Yeah, yeah. It's just meant to like. I just thought it was kind of like a like a kind of like I don't want to say aggressive kind of pattern. I just wanted something that was you know felt power powerful and strong because it's meant to be like what we would call like a battle jacket. And I think we have a slide or two as influence yeah, of that. I think maybe, up. well, we've got, oh, sorry. There's Braun right there. <laughs> That's Braun drumming. drumming. I think he's faking it actually. <laughs> press photo probably. I think that was like a press photo. Yeah. But, um, Looks you good. know, look him up. He plays for the band Macedon. They're, they're uh, originally from Atlanta, Georgia. I, I'm originally from Georgia. Hmm. And uh, this band is his life. He is a professional musician. They travel the world. They they are like an arena rock band, if you're not familiar with them. And I'm actually about to start making him another custom jacket. Hmm. Uh, coincidentally, he's coincidentally he's uh, from, a, he's a big Buffalo Bills fan. Hmm. And so I'm going to make him a Buffalo Bills uh, football jacket. And cool. my father, my father-in-law was born and raised in Buffalo. So my father-in-law is a huge Buffalo Bills fan. So when I told him I was about to make this jacket for Braun, he was, he was very, very proud. <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh, we got some examples of battle jackets. Yeah, this is like just basically where I'm kind of pulling reference and influence from is 
these homemade jackets. So, you know, I came out of the Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia punk rock scene of the early 90s, early to mid 90s. And this idea of like DIY, do it yourself mentality, like was very important to me. So like make your own jackets, like make your own cover art for your band, like et cetera, was really important. Like everything was done like without without mainstream help, without like sponsors, it was all done by whoever, the, by the individual. And that kind of mentality was very important to me as a teenager and it carried on into adulthood and more specifically into my art making practice. And that's why I make all the work entirely myself unless I'm doing um, a few collaborative pieces. But even with the collaborative pieces, it's, it's at least like a 50-50 uh, and how we're making that particular piece, like be a jacket or a tote bag. But these battle jackets were, are, of, are a good example of inspiration. Like these people wearing them made them themselves. And, you know, they started on the patches on themselves. They did the studs, et cetera. And I like that very kind of like punk rock aesthetic. It's very kind of very raw. So did you learn how to sew by making your own battle jacket or? <laughs> I, I learned I learned, learned how to sew from a book, but I learned yeah. how to sew basically from a book and from you know my mom and a girlfriend, my an ex girlfriend of mine, uh, helped me out a lot, and, and as did my mother. My mother would always hem my jeans and mm -hmm. my sister's jeans, um, even up to pretty recently. <laughs> so oh, yeah. that was always good. Calling home and asking mom uh, sewing. Mm -hmm tips has always been very helpful throughout the years. Cool. And you've made more than one jacket too. And right. we're not all like I, battle jacket inspired because this one is not exactly battle jacket. <laughs> yeah, this what is, I would call. Right. This is like a long a long coat and it was a collaboration with Yvonne Ortiz Taylor, a very good friend of mine, fashion designer down in Los Angeles. It's really and cool. And it it was this started out as a quilt that I had made, so it was a quilt, and I'd exhibited it around for a few years. I'd been to a couple of galleries and one or two museums, and I was like, you know, I, I want to rework this somehow, but I'm not really sure what to do. And so Avon and I were talking. She's like, let's make it into like a long coat. So she came up with the pattern. She made the pattern. She designed the pattern herself. I sent the quilt down to LA. She cut it up and made it into this long coat. Wow. And I think it's personally it's one of the favorite, my favorite pieces that I've that we've ever done. And that's her yeah. wearing it right there in her studio. Yeah, she looks great wearing it. Wow. Yeah, it fits her perfectly coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> and she has it. So it's her, like she wears it around LA when um her husband's a good friend of mine and he's also a very talented artist as well and when they go out to art openings she'll wear it but it's and like if if you unfortunately we can't zoom in but like every little detail is like the buttons are of of a certain type of button and then the inside the pocket looks like an oven mitt it's like the shape of an oven mitt like on the oh. inside part and then like it has these kind of straps to like tighten the collars it's, hmm. it's it's cool. I, I thought it came out really well. And all I really did was just send her this like uh, quilt and then she she kind of cut it up. So she for this one, she did um, a lot of the work. Hmm. I can't help but laugh uh, at the kind of irony of an artist cutting up their own quilt and turning them into a <laughs> coat after so many people have um, talked about their feelings about people cutting up quilts and turning them into clothes in the last couple of years, but we're not here. Yeah. To yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know. I know that's come up a lot within the quilting <laughs> community. The only thing that I would say was that that quilt I made myself, it wasn't yeah, something yeah. I bought like um, at a flea market or mm. somewhere else. It was one that I made entirely myself. And yeah, we've also, we also did another one where we, mm. we cut up a quilt that I made and turned it into like, this customized vest. Oh. So yeah, I I, I get it. It's <laughs> just funny. I had to remark. <laughs> We've got a few more quilts that you'd like to share, I think, here in only a few more minutes, 15 more minutes or so. Um, so you can maybe just move things along a little bit. Sure. 
Okay. Yeah, this one, this one's Tiger versus Tiger. It's meant to mimic like old, like older kind of poker playing cards with like the mirrored oh. image, which is why you see the hearts and then like the upside down tiger. And I wanted like really bright fabric for this. This was commissioned by this restaurant group up in Canada. And so it's hanging, I think in Ontario or Toronto or another Canadian city that I'm blanking on, maybe Vancouver. But, um, and so it, I wanted it to really pop, which I, I like, again, I like these really bright colors. So there's kind of like neon yellow, uh, sulky thread I use a lot. Um, so we, we can go on to the next. How is, how do these uh, commissions come about? And I'd just love to know, do people approach you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, people approach me, but they find me online, social media, mm -hmm. word of mouth, et cetera. And then we start the, the ever oh so fun process of like, you know, back and forth about commission, what they want versus where is it going to hang versus budget, yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada. Uh, gritty, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The part that I don't really like dealing with, I just like to like make the work like, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty particular about commissions. I won't take anything that comes across oh, okay. my table. I'm pretty particular about what do I what I say yes to, because like at the end of the day, it's still something that I made out there in the world. And I don't want it to represent something that I'm not, that I cannot get behind per se, whatever mm -hmm. that might be. So I, I, I try to be as very conscious of, of that aspect of it all. This is another, this was uh, another commission that accompany the tiger versus tiger and it's like mm. midnight flyer it's an owl and i use this kind of uh, snake skin colorful fabric for mm. the feathers because i really like how that looked and again yeah. these like kind of bright colors and bright thread and it's kind of again it's hanging in this restaurant and it's the restaurant's not like super well lit so i wanted it to kind of pop right? ah. so that was the that was the idea so to speak for these oh. So how many commissions do you normally do per year? Uh, that, I mean, that fluctuates like anything. Like I, the last year I've kind of taken on a lot more just because things have kind of shifted within the fine art world a little bit for me. And a lot of the commissions have been people that I know personally. And so they're like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I'll totally do that for you. It's going to take me like, you know, four months to get around to it if you're okay with that. And they're like, yeah, totally. So I'm like, all right, well then I can do it. Mm -hmm. Just like, as everyone knows, it's watching this, you know, stuff takes a long time to make. So there's yeah. only so many hours in the day and only so many days in the week and it's only so many weeks in the month, et cetera. So, hmm. you know, you know, cool. take, take on what you want to do as opposed to wasting your time on something else. I love, uh, there's kind of a, a, a punk rock metalhead ethos running through all of your work here. <laughs> yeah love yeah it. absolutely yeah yeah that's it. kind of the goal this one is a, a good example of exactly that find your people referencing yeah. a patty patty smith lyric and it was a commission for my friend jerry business a lot of those shirts were his hmm. and it's hanging at his house and then and then combined with some used denim it's really great and there's um recognize some of the bands yeah it's kind of one thing i really like about your work is looking at the details and seeing if I can uh, recognize the band t-shirts <laughs> or the artists. <laughs> it's kind of right. a fun so, version of I Spy quilt. Exactly. It's kind of like, where is Cameron San Diego within the quilt a little bit, or where's Waldo? And I like that yeah. idea to it. And it's kind of, for me, it's more referencing this, like, it doesn't matter what, what you, what, are you in the fun art world? Are you in the quilting world are you in the punk rock world are you in are you part of skateboarding like you come to see my work in person you bring these different kind of you know experiences to you but i my hope is that my work can kind of speak to everyone it speaks to the quilting community i hope it speaks to the fine art community i hope and it speaks to punk rock skateboarding etc so it's like if you come from punk rock community you're like oh i recognize that band that band and that band if you don't if you come from like the textile world like oh how did he do that like is that a satin stitch is it applique like how did he <laughs> construct this and I, and I like i like having those conversations it's always a different conversation it's not always about like you know paint oh, on yeah. canvas and that's it right uh, yeah you probably ran you 
went through art school, so you probably maybe ran away from that. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> uh, a little, a little bit. I still oh, primarily yeah. operate within the contemporary fine art world. I exhibit oh, my okay. work in galleries and museums all around the world, and okay. so that's kind of that's more the world I'm familiar with, hmm. uh, for the most part. Uh, like all the work we've seen here has been exhibited. Yeah. In the past, like few years. Uh, this this quilt in particular has been at like two or three museums in the last couple of years. It's owned by a good friend of mine who's a tattoo artist uh, mm -hmm. here in San Francisco. His name is Henry Lewis. So he's been generous enough to loan this quilt out um, two or three times. Yeah, I saw it in person at the Lux Center here in Lincoln, right. Nebraska. And I was struck by this quilt when I first saw it. Not because of the blaze orange color, which is brilliant, but <laughs> because it looked really similar to a quote that the museum has. And <laughs> you, I asked you in our meetings running up to this, if you had seen it or if you'd taken inspiration and you were shocked to learn, right? That, yeah, uh, let's let's go to that one. Is that okay. the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I was like, I was, I was like, it's exactly the same. That's incredible. And it's yeah, you know, over a hundred years old. I was like, that is amazing. Yeah. And it's meant to mimic a fence pattern, but this is like circa 1830, 1850. Like mine's yeah. meant, meant to mimic a metal fence. Yeah, there we go back right? and forth a couple of times. I know it's crazy. It's yeah. really funny. I mean, I I thought that I was great. Yeah, it's really cool. Obviously, I don't think that chain link fences existed in 1830. And if they did, this person probably didn't take inspiration from them to make a quote. I, I, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but uh, for me, it, it's, it, it was just like an amazing link to like, you know, uh, quilters in the past. And that's what, like, if you go back to my quilt, like yeah. that uh this one and a couple other ones these are pretty recent I, I wanted to start kind of loosely referencing uh you know more kind of traditional quilt patterns that i had seen and kind of unbeknownst to me i definitely did that with with this particular piece which is made up of like used car heart used dicky pants and used denim jeans and waterproof camouflage um I love so it. it's like i thought that was so amazing when we when we we were talking about getting ready for this this talk you you um, showed me that and i was like that ah, we have to include that in the lecture yeah it's really cool and i it like um shows the kind of connection to quilt making that you just uh obviously have it's born into you or something <laughs> yeah it's like yeah. a way to pay to pay homage to people yeah. that came before me and i uh, and also who i'm influenced by like Again, like my my primary influence in all this work is the quilters of G's Bend, mm. and that's what's ultimately led me to working primarily within the textile medium. Here's another right. example. This is Dickie's pants, Carhartt fabric, and denim. Uh, the Dickie's pants are all from my good friend Randy Dotson, who also photographs all my work. Um, a while back, his wife told him he needed to clean out the dresser drawer because he had a bunch of just old pants and he shows up over at our apartment with this huge garbage bag of dicky pants. He's like, here you go. And so, and I was like, he probably, he maybe he washed them, but I'm not entirely sure. So my wife was like, you should just wash them just in case before you start cutting them up. So I, I washed them all and then turned them into this quilt. And then I was like, hey, I made this quilt. Can you come photograph it? And I was like, it's got all your pants in it. So he basically had to like, came over to photograph his own pants in a quilt. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> I was like, that's um, all you, man. <laughs> I love it. Um, so like the chain patterning, you just came up with that or was there any kind yeah. of your symbolism behind it that's just like referencing like metal chains but it's made yeah. out of like soft fabric again yeah. i like that dichotomy the that contrast. opposite the contrast of it Super the menacing fun. the menacing contrast of the imagery and the material is important to me on top of it again being functional uh, i think we have maybe one more slide here yeah 
Oh, I'll talk fast and we get to questions. Uh, this yeah. was uh, Flower Leopard. This was at this was the entrance to my most recent solo exhibition at the Hickory Art Museum in Hickory, North Carolina. It opened this past August. Mm -hmm. uh, the name of the exhibition was Bang Your Head. Again, a kind of play on fabric and music. And the Flower Leopard was a commission by a friend of mine, it was for his wife. They live in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. He's a very well established musician. And so I made that quote for him. And then the wallpaper, I designed the wallpaper on the back oh. that the quilt is on top of. And the Hickory Museum printed up uh, a lot of wallpaper for the exhibition. And it's, I just thought that was a really cool photo. I thought that quilt looked really good on overlaid of the wallpaper that I designed. So I thought it'd be kind of cool, cool to include that one. Wow, cool. I didn't know. Uh, so are you a surface designer as well? You design patterns or just for your You know, own? anything anything interesting that comes across, I'm like, yeah, I'll figure out how to do that. Like I designed that wallpaper pattern in, in Procreate on my iPad. So I was, mm -hmm. I'm pretty, I'm very familiar with like Adobe Photoshop and the Adobe, Adobe Creative Suite programs. But more recently I've tried to, have a stronger grasp on how to use the program Procreate on my laptop or sorry on my iPad. So this was a good a good uh, trial run. I was like, oh, I got to design. I got to do this wallpaper by the certain day so they can have it made and install it. So I was like, I better figure this out. So I just kind of put my head down and figured it out. Wow. Do you? Uh, I'm so impressed. You do it all. <laughs> I'm like, and you just jump right in. Fearless. It's you know, it's all it's all learning as you go, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you fake it, fake it, fake <laughs> it until until someone else can come and do it better. <laughs> or you get some really good advice along the way. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I love it. Totally. I think there's totally. kind of a yeah, a punk rock uh spirit that's uh threading through your work here. Yeah, and everything I'll, that I'll, you everything you say. It's always say cool. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, I that is the end of our PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'd love to maybe take it. Uh, we've got some Q questions in the chat here. I can um, read them off if you would like. I'll stop sharing my screen, and then we could maybe answer. Um, I'll go back to the first one. Uh, Somebody wants to know, Jan Rogers wants to know, where did you study art? I studied, I got my BFA from the uh, from Georgia State University and I got my MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. And I was adjunct faculty at the San Francisco Art Institute right up until the pandemic hit. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, this is going to be kind of a random selection of questions here, Ben. So that's okay. Just be prepared. Are you make vegan? it interesting? Are you vegan? Am I vegan? <laughs> oh no, I was uh, I was vegetarian for a long time in my late oh, teens yeah. and early twenties, but I, I like chicken fingers too much. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but that's probably <laughs> referencing the restaurant. Yeah, the restaurant is the, yeah, the little Saint restaurant where I made that curtain for. Is it's a very very high-end and good vegan restaurant. So if you're in uh, Healdsburg or Sonoma and you're, you know, doing your wine tour, um, stop by the Little Saint downtown Healdsburg, get your vegan meal. They have coffee and wine, of course, and ask to go see the curtain upstairs. Sounds fantastic. I would love to go. Um, but um, here. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I got a great question. Somebody asked, um, "Do you worry about copyright infringement with any of the any of your work, like with the use of re, uh, repurposed band T-shirts?" Um, that's a good question. It's cut like it's come up once. Um, I think it was HGTV. Was that Home and Gardening TV was going to do a piece on me like many years ago and. I had a, one or two phone calls with the producer and then I got an email email from him saying like, all right, he's like the lawyers nixed it. And they were worried about copyright infringement. And then it did come up again 
when I was interviewed on uh, CBS Sunday morning news, like mm. national, the national show. And they, they aired the piece, but then they didn't put it like online, not because of me, but because they had used music like for the soundtrack. And I don't think they, from bands. So that, so that was like maybe a little bit of it, but um, my, my argument is it's like, it's only a fraction of the design and the design like, for the t-shirt for the band t-shirt and like like i said it's uh it's it was used it's recycled and you know a lot of the times i'll tag the band of the shirt that i'm using to give them credit or and or if i know the person who, who designed the t-shirt to try to give credit as best i could i'm not perfect i do make mistakes i have made mistakes in the past um you know i, I apologize for that but uh for the most part like yeah like I said, it's just like a small fraction of that of that design, typically. Yes. But it has come up a little bit. It's <laughs> a good question. A number of people are asking um, kind of construction or technique questions. Like um, many people or a couple of people have asked uh, about the um, actual sewing of your fabrics. Like, do you... Um, and the, like the overall design, like the circle and the pentagram inside the um, uh, thrasher quilt, like how did you draw that out and pattern it? And how did you, how would you have sewn it? You can answer a bunch of these questions at the same time. Yeah, sure. So for me, everything starts with uh, sketches in the sketchbook. And then I find like I get a sketch that I like, I take that and import it into Photoshop typically. So now I'm working on the computer in Photoshop and I will refine the design and then scale it to whatever size I want it to be. So mm -hmm. the Thrasher quilt, I think it's like around six or seven feet. So I have that design to at that size as a Photoshop file. And then I then I make templates, like kind of like poster board templates, like like how you'd make like a suit or a dress. And then I overlay that template on top of the fabric and then cut out that shape and then uh -huh. applicate all applique it all on. That with the 505 basting spray, another shameless plug. Um, so it's basic with the basting spray, applique, and then typically you use a satin stitch. And it's that's pretty much how I've done all the work. Even the jackets are done like that. Wow. Um, I think we have, um, I think that about covers our questions and we're a little, it's like 203 now. So I think, uh, oh yeah, somebody asked, uh, has a really good question. How do you store all of your quilts? Are they uh, flat? Do you prefer to sell them as you don't have to store them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that preference is to sell them, yes, and get rid yeah. of them. I'd much rather than be out there in the world with a collector or a, a few are, are in museum collections. But the ones I have not sold are typically rolled up and stored, uh, rolled up in plastic and then wrapped and then stored in like cardboard tubes, hmm. like how you would uh do like concrete pillars hmm. or also how you would ship like a big rug so I have, I have like one or two large and i mean like pretty large like six and a half feet long 12 inch diameter cardboard tube that it's thick and hmm. then i roll the quilts up and slide them into there in plastic and then i typically store them like that and which is not too different from how some of the museums store them they have them a little bit more climate controlled and kind of on a roll because I've been into the storage, textile storage area of the De Young Museum. And I was, because I was interested in how they stored them. So it's not too dissimilar. But uh, as far as my, the collectors, I mean, if once you purchase, once they own the piece, it's kind of up to them. Hmm. But I think they kind of do have a similar thing. That, that's a good question. Yeah. Um... Well, thank you so much, Ben, for your time and sharing every kind of little bit about yourself and your work. It was like such a great honor to talk to you. Um, thank you so much. 
Well, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share my work with uh, Textile Talk. And um, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah, have a good one. Thank you. All right. You too. <laughs> Talk again soon. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.